Saints. And now, Virgin Most Powerful Radio is pleased to present Hands-On Apologetics with renowned Catholic author and apologist, Gary Machuda. And welcome, everybody, to Hands-On Apologetics. You have entered into Virgin Most Powerful's Apologetics Dojo. I'm Gary Machuda. Welcome. Uh, well, yeah, we had a little bit of a delay, but we are back on track and ready to rock and roll in uh, this endeavor to explain, defend the faith, clarity, charity, and confidence, get, get bulked up, you know, do our exercises so that we'll be uh, – instruments in the hands of the lord to to bring good news about him and his church so uh welcome aboard everybody uh we have a great show in store for you today of course as you know halloween's coming up and uh, i'm sure we're going to have the rundown on uh all the pagan elements of halloween what to do what to not do what's proper what's not proper uh but i always look to go on the offense you know i i don't like playing defense all the time i like playing offense and when it comes to opportunities like this, uh, this is a great chance for us to help others get the lowdown about the Christian origins behind the feast. Not just All Hallows E, but All Hallows itself, namely All Saints Day. So to help us uh, kind of work through the biblical and historical background to this feast, we're going to have William Albrecht. So he's going to give us lots of great info for us to share with anybody who curious to know you know what exactly is halloween really supposed to be about so he's coming on the show on the other side of the break also we are going to do our finding the fallacy which today is the faulty generalization and meet an early church father who is saint andrew of crete so get some great stuff in store for us today and uh, i want to welcome all of you watching on social media on live stream in facebook and youtube hello everybody I was actually chatting with the uh, the uh, YouTube uh, chat room section of the dojo, you know, before the break. I had some great ideas, <laughs> maybe a, a test pattern or something, you know, <laughs> or uh, or some corny music to play <laughs> during the during the reboots or whatever. But uh, hey, thanks everybody, and welcome everybody listening live on radio and also through podcast. Welcome aboard! All are welcome in the dojo when we. Uh, you know, dive into this uh, defending the faith stuff. It's always great to have you aboard. All right, so while we jump into the finding of the fallacy, and today's finding of the fallacy is the faulty generalization fallacy. Uh, this goes by a number of different terms. In fact, we kind of uh, covered some similar ones. Faulty generalization fallacy is when a conclusion uh, about all or many instances of a phenomenon uh, that has been reached on the basis of just one or maybe a few instances of that phenomenon. So in other words, uh, it's improper foundation to make a generalization. You might uh, run into, um, oh, let's see. Uh, someone could say this Italian restaurant uh, was bad food. That Italian restaurant had bad food. Therefore, all Italian restaurants have bad food. Well, you know, you can't judge all Italian restaurants on the basis of just a couple. Right. So that would be insufficient grounds for a generalization or a general conclusion. Hence, the fallacy of the faulty generalization. And we get this all the time with, um, oh, um, you know, with scandals. You know, we hear one scandal here, another scandal there. The faulty generalization is, well, all people in that group cause scandal. Right. So it's just uh, basically just not laying down proper foundation for a generalization. And uh, so that's our finding of the fallacy for today, the faulty generalization. And uh, let's go to our Meet the Early Father today. I know we're kind of going a little quick, but we missed uh, a couple of minutes before the program. So let's make up some time with St. Andrew of Crete, who was born roughly around 8660, died 8740. St. Andrew of Crete is also known as Andrew of Jerusalem. He's reckoned as one of the principal composers of the hymns of the Eastern Church. He was born in Damascus, like I said, around the year A.D. 660. Um, uh, became a monk 
in Jerusalem at the Monastery of the Holy Sepulchre at the age of 14 or 15 and was ordained a deacon at Constantinople in 685. In about the year 692, he became Archbishop of, I'm going to butcher this name, but I think it's Gortney in Crete. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, at the Monothelite uh, Synod of Constantinople, Constantinople in 712, uh, he subscribed to the Monothelite repudiation of the two wills of Christ. And uh, although this doctrine was later had been defined in the Third Council or Sixth Ecumenical Council of Constantinople, 680, 681, uh, he did subscribe to the Monothelite Creed. Now, what is monothelism? You know, when you listen to this program, especially the Mithrilite Fathers, there's always a few heresies that uh, were dominant during the time of the early church fathers, like Arianism, Gnosticism. And then you have monophysism and you have monothelism. Monothelism basically is uh, the idea that Christ only had one will. But you know what? St. Andrew of Crete, although he signed on to it, he repudiated it. He came back to the Orthodox faith. And he also wrote some awesome hymns about the Blessed Virgin Mary. So I hear the music. So on the other side of the break, William Albrecht will be joining us. We're going to talk about the real roots of Halloween. Welcome to our January 11, 2020 Spiritual Warfare Conference. Every year without fail, this is our most popular, well-attended event. This year's Spiritual Warfare Conference will host Adam Bly, a Catholic demonologist and an auxiliary member of the International Association of Exorcists, along with Dr. Luis Sandoval, a psychiatrist who's part of the Healing, Deliverance, and Exorcism team for the Diocese of Orange. These two gentlemen bring tons of experience and expertise in the area of spiritual warfare. This is going to be a high-information Catholic seminar. I'll be there as well, sharing some riveting stories on the diabolical and liberation found through Jesus Christ from my best-selling book, The Devil in the City of Angels. Mark your calendars, come and join us, and meet other radio hosts from Jesus 911. Contrary to popular belief, spiritual warfare is not demon-centered. It's Christ-centered. Come join us and learn how to armor up and fight the good fight of faith. Catholics, wake up. Don't hit the snooze button. Join us at St. Christopher Catholic Church, 629 South Glendora Avenue, West Covina, California, on January 11, 2020. See you then. Strength and honor in Jesus' name. Jesus said in Matthew 26, Stay awake and pray that you may not enter into temptation. According to St. Ephraim, Jesus, who feared nothing, experienced fear and asked to be freed from death, although he knew it was impossible. How much more must we persevere in prayer before temptation assails us, so that we may be freed when the test has come? May God grant that we may withstand temptation and carry out His will in all things. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. And welcome back, everybody, to Hands-On Apologetics. And, uh, you know, Halloween's coming up. And, uh, th like I said, there's an awful lot of paganism. There's also a lot of... Uh, things that Christians and Catholics should know about and avoid. But there's also the truth about Halloween and its Christian origins. So we're going to have as our guest William Albrecht. William Albrecht joins us. He's a convert to the Catholic faith. He's also an international speaker and debater. He's participated in over 50 live and moderated debates. William runs a website dedicated to the early church fathers, which includes unique translations, articles, commentaries, and debates on the Father, and you can learn more about them 
at his website, patristicpillars.com. And William, welcome to Hands On Apologetics. Gary, it is always a great pleasure to be on. Thank you for having me on, my friend. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you caught the beginning of the program, but our early church father for today was Andrew Crete. Oh, wow. I did not. I did not catch that. Yeah, so that fits in really well with uh, what, we, what your uh, latest debate was, which was uh, with an Orthodox gentleman on the Immaculate Conception. That is very, very true. F- fits in perfectly. And I would recommend everybody go and uh, listen to that. You can get to hear a lot of the early church fathers, and uh, you get to see that the church has always taught that Our Lady is completely sinless, completely sinless nature from the very beginning of her creation by God. Yeah, so uh, it, it, well, uh, tell us a little bit about the debate. Uh, how did it go? The, I think the debate went very, very well, Gary. I think um, I debated an Eastern Orthodox deacon, and we talked about whether or not Mary was immaculate. And for the heart of the Catholic teaching on this, I would argue the ancient Christian teaching on this, is that from her very creation, God had set Mary aside Mary was created with a completely wholly sinless nature. Some people on the East tend to argue that she was cleansed at the Annunciation um, or or a little bit beforehand. But in Catholicism, we argue from the very beginning she was completely holy. And I believe the fathers from the East from the very beginning taught that as well, Gary. Yeah, very good. Yeah, that's uh, something I think a lot of uh, Catholics, especially, you know, in the West, that we're, we're not familiar with that Orthodox um, although they believe Mary sanctified, they they uh, yes. generally don't subscribe to uh, her being sanctified at her conception. That that is correct, and and really, if you look at what the early fathers say, Gary, when they hearken to Holy Writ, when they look at the Old Testament, then the New Testament, the East and the West, they believed Mary was completely sinless, and not at a later period in time, they believed. By nature, Mary was sinless. And of course, as we know, if Mary had a sinless nature, that means she must have been immaculately conceived. Yeah, yeah, very good. Well, uh, you know, I look forward to hearing the debate. Is it up on Patristic Pillars yet or uh, YouTube? It is up already. I I put it up this morning, so it's up already. All right, yeah, check it out. Where is it? Is it on both or just YouTube? It's on YouTube and on my website. Okay, very good. Yeah, patristicpillars.com. Check it out, folks. Uh, William's got great stuff on there and, uh, you know, and some awesome debates, and uh, I look forward to hearing it. So uh, check it out. And, William, you know, Halloween's coming up, and, uh, and th- there's a lot of bad things, you know, uh, lots of pagan uh, mixtures and, and things that really, you know, I think uh, Catholics shouldn't get involved in. But this is such a great opportunity, isn't it, for us to share with others, you know, the real meaning of All Souls Day or All, or excuse me, All Saints Day. No doubt, Gary, no doubt. And the one thing that I really love about Halloween, because let me tell you, I love Halloween. The one thing I love about it is the fact that as a Catholic, we should not allow anybody for, uh, anybody per- perpetrating the argument that it's a pagan holiday. Don't allow them to hijack this holiday from you. It is a holy day in Catholicism when we look forward to All Saints Day and All Souls Day. And it is a festival that has been celebrated from very, very ancient times. It gives us the opportunity to look at the horrible that is being put forth in the media and then to look behind the curtain and say, well, where does this come from? Is there anything deeper than this? Maybe is there an or where, where does the origin of this come from? And when we look at the origin of this, Gary, we will find that we can find as early as ancient Judaism festivals being celebrated. You look at Leviticus 23, we read, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, These are the appointed festivals of the Lord that you shall proclaim as holy convocations, my appointed festivals. So as early as Judaism, we can see festivals that God told Moses were hagias, meaning holy. When we start with that as a starting point, as we look forward, as we go forward, we're going to find out just exactly what is Halloween. And we're going to find out that really this is something very, very Catholic. 
Yeah, yeah, that's interesting because, uh, yeah, I think that would be the right place to start, especially if you're talking to a Bible Christian, you know, that uh, styles himself for following the Bible alone. You can point out that God himself likes festivals. He likes holy days. And it's certainly yes. rooted in the Old Testament. And, uh, yeah, so take us from there. Let's let's move on. Yeah, I really love looking. I really love hopping on over to the New Testament as well, Gary. Gary, we look at Matthew 26. Because, you know, sometimes people will say, well, you know what? You're looking at the Old Testament, um, Mosaic Law, what have you. We move to the New Testament. Festivals are gone, guys. Not true. We look at Matthew chapter 26. But they were saying, not during the festival, lest a riot occur among the people. We hop on over to Mark 14, too. For they were saying, not during the festival, lest there be a riot. So we're looking at what the Bible is talking about. We've got multiple authors of the, of the Gospels telling us that there were a variety of festivals being celebrated in the time of Christ. So we know, not just from here, but hopping on over to Colossians 2 as well, the trend of feast days in honor of the Lord, festivals, was very prevalent. We go to Colossians 2 and we read, Therefore, do not let anyone condemn you in matters of food and drink, or observing festivals, new moons, or Sabbath. These are only a shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. So Paul is already telling us from the very beginning that feast days, festivals are being observed to give honor to Christ, our God. So the substance is always pointing towards God, towards the Lord. That is what makes a festival holy in the eyes of the Lord. And I think if we look at that, Gary, we look at what the Bible talks about, then we hop into the early church. We can find when they talk about feast days and festivals, these were prevalent from the very beginning. Now, why are we talking about festivals? People might be thinking, well, you know what? What are Gary and William talking about? You know, we wanted to hear about Halloween. We're going to get to that because that is precisely what All Hallows Eve is talking about. That is precisely what this is. This is a feast day, a festival. And from the very beginning, festivals were prevalent in the Bible and in the early church. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that's an interesting argument. You know, Paul says don't condemn people because of festivals and so on because there are shadows. Well, obviously, there was no problem with festivals that uh, celebrate the substance of the faith, right? Jesus Christ. Yes, that is ver that's very true, Gary. And that, that would be why when we look at the early church, remember the, when we talk about the early church fathers, these guys were taught— they were trained by the apostles, those that heard Christ talk, those that saw his miracles in the flesh. When they began to comment on Leviticus, we've got people like Origen of Alexandria telling us that when Paul is talking about festivals of the Lord, he was passing down the truest doctrine, we're told. And then we're told participation of the feast days was a shadow of the future. And then we look at the great basil of Caesarea in his 16th homily. He says that Sabbaths are, are pleasant and holy. But then he also includes festivals in the same conversation, saying that this is the spiritual law of God, and they are pleasant and holy and beautiful in God's eyes. Yeah, yeah, very good. And like you said, uh, you know, what makes them pleasing is really what they point towards. And, uh, you know, with the old law, it was pointing towards Christ. And the new law, like I said, it's, uh, you know, we celebrate the life of Christ. And uh, and so, uh, you know, someone would say, well, no, that's not true, because all souls day, you're celebrating the saints. You're not celebrating Christ. How would you answer that? That's a very, very good question, Gary. And I would point them to the great St. Ambrose. I love talking about St. Ambrose. When in, in his letter on the death of his brother, Satyrus, he writes, he says that festival days, feast days, ultimately point towards the body of Christ, the faithful. You might be wondering, well, you know what, what does that have to do with uh, celebrating Christ? That has everything to do with it. Yeah. Because if we look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians, we're all connected in the body of Christ. We're told that all of us are in the body of Christ and the head the principal head is Jesus Christ. So, as Augustine says, when he talks, he defends feast days, by the way, he says that when Paul talks about them, they show the form of the character of the faithful. 
And I think that that is incredible, Gary, because this is all connected. And when we honor and celebrate the saints, those holy ones that are not dead, Gary, but they're even more alive in Christ, as Mark chapter 12 says, I think that brings out the beauty of our faith even more. Oh, yeah, absolutely. In fact, I think that's something that a lot of uh, uh, Protestants miss is this unity of the head and body of Christ. For example, like when Christ is here on earth, uh, when, uh, you know, valuable spike nard was uh, used to anoint his physical body, it wasn't just honoring the physical body of Christ. It was honoring God, you know. It, yes. So to honor, honor his physical body was to honor, you know, his divinity if the church is the body of christ then honoring the saints is just another way of honoring god through the uh, the grace that he bestowed on these saints that made him saints no doubt gary and that is that is particular particularly why when we look at revelation 5 when the incredible prayers are coming up from the earth and the saints in heaven are receiving them in bowls of incense and they're like the, the greek tells us they're, 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 they're serving them. They're bowing down to the Lamb, Christ, and offering them as a sacrifice. What does that show us? The prayers are coming from the earth, going up to the saints, and then they're presenting them to the Lamb. Gary, if that is not the intercession of the saints, and if that doesn't show the mystical body of Christ connected, I don't know what does. That is incredible imagery, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Or, you know, my favorite is, of course, the, the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, where Jesus oh, yeah. says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he should have said, I'm not persecuting you. I'm just persecuting your disciples, you know, but Christ yeah. is like, no, you, you're persecuting me. No doubt. And you know what, Gary? I have a feeling Paul knew exactly what Christ was talking about there. He must have probably stopped and thought, you know what? I'm murdering the Christians. I'm persecuting them. But in essence, I am going right to the head and I am persecuting Christ, who he eventually accepted as his Lord. And we all know that that was an incredible moment. Yeah, absolutely. And if persecuting is to persecute Christ, maybe honoring the saints is like honoring Christ. Think about it. We're chatting with William Albrecht about the Catholic roots of Halloween. Stay tuned, everybody. Welcome, Daniel. You're on the line. What's on your mind, brother? Hi, I just wanted to share a testimony about Virgin Most Powerful Radio. I had a buddy at work who, you know, he's a lukewarm Catholic guy, and I wanted him to start listening to the Terry and Jesse show, so I kept telling him to download the app, and he kept putting me off. So one day, I grabbed his phone, and I downloaded the app <laughs> for him. I went on vacation, and you know, I kept telling him to listen to it. He was kind of put me off. I came back from vacation. He comes to my cubicle, and he says to me, Hey, man, I've been listening to Terry and Jesse's show, and it's great. And it's uh, made a big impact in his life. The guy, he's going to weekly adoration a couple times a wow. week. He goes to the Mass in the morning. Mm -hmm. and, uh, he's an uh, on-fire Catholic, and he promotes uh, the Terry and Jesse show on the Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Wow. Daniel, what a testimony. And I want to encourage our listeners to get those cards by going to virginmostpowerfulradio.org and uh, do what Daniel's doing. Go out and spread the faith by inviting people to listen to Virgin Most Powerful. Daniel, thanks for your testimony, brother. God love you. You're welcome. This is Terry Barber. I want to invite you to take advantage of having your funeral or your loved one's funeral at the Sacred Heart Chapel in downtown Covina. It's a 115-year-old church, beautiful chapel, and all you got to do is call me at 661-972-7872, and I'll personally make the arrangements with your mortuary to have your funeral or your loved one's funeral here at Sacred Heart Chapel. You won't regret it. 661-972-7872. God love you. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. 
and they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. This is Jesse Romero. You're listening to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And welcome back, everybody. We are with Master Apologist William Albrecht, and we're talking about the Catholic roots of All Saints Day, otherwise known as All Hallows and All Hallows Eve, otherwise known as Halloween. You guessed it. And <laughs> Yeah, that was a weird intro, but at least I got to the subject. Uh, yeah, uh, to honor the body is to honor Christ and uh so the early church fathers didn't really have problems with feast days and uh, uh, solemnities like uh, All Saints Day. Uh, William, uh, I can't hear you. Dialoguing. Ah, I got you. Are you able to hear me? Okay, yes. great. Yeah, you're, you're 100% correct there, Gary. They had no problem with that at all. But then you might have some people that might might ask, well, okay, they had no problem with feast days, but what about Halloween? Well, we're about to get to that because not only did they have no problem with feast days, they had no problem with feast days in honor of the dead. And when we hop on over to the 200s, when we look at Tertullian, as we know Tertullian, at, at one point in his life, he was a very, um, he was a very faithful Catholic before, before he fell off. Um, but he provided a great witness. And when he, he began to talk about um, prayer for the dead. And then he began to, to tell us that these were very prevalent. These were going on in the early church. And he, he told us in, in his crown, the crown, we offer sacrifices for the dead on their birthday anniversaries. And he talked about how their earthly death was merely passing over into the eternal abode of heaven. So Tertullian was very clear that the soul could benefit from these prayers from the Eucharistic sacrifices. He wrote, one could find rest and that he may, maybe, he might be able to share in the first resurrection. And each year on the anniversary of his death, sacrifice was offered. So what do we get from Tertullian? Really, Gary, we get something incredibly significant because Tertullian is opening up the curtain and we're getting a vision. We're getting a look into the early church where from the very beginning, prayer for the dead Prayer to the dead was very, very prevalent and was practiced very often. Yeah, yeah, very good. Yeah, the the birthdays, their birthday anniversaries. Of course, they're not talking about the day of her birth, are they? No, they are not. Very good point, Gary. I, I was about to get to that. They're not talking about their their exact birthday because remember, in the early church, a lot of the times when they celebrated the dead, the birth for them was when they passed on over into eternal life, they began their new life in the abode of Christ with the saints in heaven. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Um, so so you have the birthdays being the anniversary of their martyrdoms or their deaths. And then uh, Tertullian says that uh, it's uh, that we should offer prayers and sacrifices during those anniversaries. Uh, yeah, it sounds an awful lot like he's talking about feast days, doesn't it? It sure does, Gary. And really, really, he must be talking about feast days. So we know we know that this celebration is not just about the saints, but really, what are they talking about, Gary? They're talking about the fact that Christ, as God, was the ultimate conqueror of death. And that is the reason why we can hop on over to the, to the 300s. We look at the great Ephraim from uh, Ephraim, Syria. He talked about celebrations of the dead in the church of his time. So he talked about celebrating the heavenly martyrs. And he tells us in his testamentum, he says, go along with me in the Psalms and in your prayers and please constantly make sacrifices for me. He tells them to not bury people with expensive perfumes, but rather Instead, to cover them with their prayers, the prayers of the faithful were worth more 
than these expensive perfumes. And then he says, remember me on the 30th day. So he's indicating that this practice of offering up sacrificial prayers for the saints a month after their birth into heaven was not only prevalent in his place where he lived, but it was a church practice that, as you pointed out, Gary, pointed towards the honor of the body of Christ. And ultimately, as we talked about earlier, ultimately, ultimately, it's head, Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah, very good. You know, there's probably, uh, William, I don't know if you agree with me, but uh, one thing I'm more, I always shy away from using this idea of uh, honoring the dead, because in the eyes of Christians, the dead aren't dead. You know, the dead are, in a sense, they're more alive to Christ now than they were on the earth, you know. And so we have to make that distinction, you know, when they leave their earthly life. And that's always kind of difficult to say. But, I mean, if a non-Catholic's listening to the program, you know, it's not like we're engaging in necromancy or something like that. To, you know, to be away from the earth is to be at home with the Lord. And uh, the saints are in glory, God willing. And uh, especially if they're martyred, they are in heaven. And so there is no, no a, doubt, Gary. A pointed feast, isn't there? Yeah, right, right. Great, great point you're making there, Gary. Because we don't believe these people are dead, as Hebrews says. Hebrews twelve one says they are. We're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. They are, they are witnesses that surround us. They guide us. They're there if we need them. If we need to call upon them for their intercession. But what I find even more incredible, Gary, if you look at Matthew or Mark. The Greek word used when we read about people that die in Christ and move on to heavenly glory with our Lord, we're told that they are zao, the Greek word for living. They are living. The present, ter- the present tense is used. They're living in Christ. They're not nekros, the Greek word for dead. They're more alive than we are because they are now in eternal glory. They are now in heaven with Christ. They're where we strive to be one day, Gary. Yeah, absolutely. Amen. And uh, yeah, so that's an important point, uh, important point, I think, that needs to be clarified, because uh, I have known for a lot of non-Catholics uh, looking in, you know, it's very easy for them to misunderstand, you know, what we mean when we're celebrating the, the feast day of the martyrs. Uh, we're not celebrating the dead. We're celebrating the living in Christ. That That is correct. Yes. And uh, I, I think that that is particularly why um I like to always look at St. John Chrysostom as well, Gary. I think okay. he really does help shed a light on what was going on in the early church. You know, we've looked at what Ephraim says. We looked at what Tertullian says. Let's hop on over to the great John Chrysostom. He's writing in the fourth century, and he talks about a festival for all saints. So we go from Ephraim, who's talking about individual ones, right? Tertullian talking about birthdays of them as well. But we know that they also stays for all of them. And if we look at what the great Chrysostom says, he talks about a feast, and he says in the Greek, for all the saints in the world who have been martyred. So we're, we're here about all of them in the whole world. But then we looked more and more, and he's talking about not just those that have been martyred, Gary, but he's including all of the faithful, all of those that have died, all of those that he believes are in heaven with Christ. And remember, Remember, this was something very, very significant for Chrysostom to say that this was a feast day. That means it wasn't just something he celebrated. This was a festival celebrated in the churches all around the world in the early church. Yeah, that's a really good point. You know, it's not like he's coming up with something new here. He's just hearkening to something that's been practiced, you know, perhaps for centuries. Yes. Yes, that is definitely correct, Gary. And really, that is the reason why when we— when we look at what the early church is saying, they provide us with with an incredible witness, really, because we look at even hopping on over to St. Gregory of Nyssa, um, who was considered, by the way, one of the greatest early church fathers. He even says that after his death, we're told by Ephraim, by the way, Ephraim talking about St. Gregory of Nyssa, he says that he must be in heaven assisting at the divine altar and before the Prince of Life with the angels praising the most holy trinity. Then he asked him, remember us all and obtain for us the pardon of our sins. Isn't that incredible, Gary? I think that is incredible yeah. imagery there. Yeah, I mean, it's so concrete. You know, it's not like a pie-in-the-sky hope, like, 
Well, St. Gregory of Nyssa, you know, he's in heaven with the angels, and isn't that nice? But, you know, St. Ephraim, it's, it's very concrete. There's no yes. doubt he's in heaven. And because of that, we need to re, you know, ask him to remember us and, uh, and ask for his prayers. Yes, no doubt. No doubt, Gary. And, and we can be certain, we can be assured when we look at the Bible, the Old Testament, we look in the New Testament, the groundwork is set for festivals in the early church. And then we look on over to the earliest times. From the very beginning, these were celebrated in the church. They were prevalent and not in only one part of the world. Because maybe you could make that argument that, oh, well, you know what? Only in Tertullian's area, these were talked about. They're talked about all over the Christian world. Yeah, very good. Very good. And, of course, you know, praying for the dead. Uh, you know, there's that word again, but praying for those who are asleep, you know, that's biblical, isn't it? It's from our favorite uh, Deuterocanonical book, Second Maccabees. No doubt, no doubt. And I love talking about 2 Maccabees 12, Gary, because as you know, 2 Maccabees 12, we get an incredible vision there of, uh, of fallen soldiers that died with vestiges of sin on their soul. So what is done? Prayer is offered up for them. Why is prayer offered up for them? Because the author of two Maccabees believed they died in godliness, but they needed to be loosed from their sins. And that is not our novel interpretation, is it, Gary? If we look at what Ephraim says in his testamentum, he does make that connection. And he says something incredible. He says, if also the sons of Mathathias who celebrated their feasts in figure only could cleanse those from guilt by their offerings who fell in battle, how much more? Shall the priests of Christ aid the dead by their sacrifices in prayer? Wow. Yeah, so, uh, you know, Mattathias being referenced to Second Maccabees. Yes, that is correct. So Ephraim is noting that he's making the contrast. He's noting how the feasts celebrated by the priests of God are much more efficacious because he says, how much more can these feasts be useful? They're not figurative yeah. festivals. They are pointing towards Christ the ultimate source of life. Right. Yeah, very good. So so the uh you know the festivals in the old covenant are pointing to the reality which is Christ and then in the new covenant that reality is made manifest in the church through our feast days. We're chatting with William Albrecht about the Catholic roots of Halloween. Stay tuned folks, more to come after the break. You're listening to Hands on Apologetics. This is Jesse Romero. And I'm Terry Barber from the Terry and Jesse Show. And we invite you to listen to the Holy Hour of Power, High Energy Catholic Radio. We're two Catholics with a PhD in common sense. We're on Monday through Friday on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. What we're going to give you is masculine Catholic teachings on the faith. You know, we say we're too inspired to be tired, we're too protected to be dejected, and we're too renewed to be subdued. Why? Because we believe in Jesus Christ and His Bride, the Church. And we will take each issue of the day and show you how the Catholic Church has the answer for our culture. What we really do is bring men back into the Catholic Church, which it's about time to do. We want men to be leaders in their Catholic faith so that they can bring their family to heaven. Our program is not right versus left. It's right versus wrong. And our program is where Catholicism and culture intersect. It's high-energy Catholic radio. We're going to inspire you to fall deeper in love with Jesus Christ and his bride in the church. The Terry and Jesse Show on the Virgin Most Powerful app. Psalm 119 says, Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light to my path. According to St. John Paul II, being a Christian means saying yes to Jesus Christ. It consists in surrendering to the Word of God and relying on it, but also endeavoring to know better and better the profound meaning of this Word. May God grant that we always rely on His Word, read it often, and put it into practice.
buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. And welcome back, everybody, Hands-On Apologetics. And uh, we're chatting with William Albrecht, uh, patristicpillars.com. And William's given a, a masterful uh, explanation of the development of the Feast of uh, all Saints Day, essentially. And William, you know, you've shown how some of the earliest church fathers were talking about honoring individual martyrs. And then now we're starting to look at uh, where it's all martyrs, you know, uh, not just the individuals. Yeah, you're correct about that, Gary. So wh- why is that so significant? I'll tell you why, because we've talked a lot about Ephraim. Ephraim in his Carmen and Sabina tells us that there were also feasts for the martyrs of all of the earth. So why is that important? Because as, as we hop on over to the 400s, we've got a great church father by the name of Maximus of Turin. So we know that by the time we get to the 400s already, Gary, the sheer amount of early Christians that have died for the faith, Gary, must have been massive. So imagine having a calendar back then. You know, as, as we may laugh and chuckle about it, but you know, it's kind of like a sad thing because that calendar must have gotten jam packed with all of the incredible martyrs for the faith, all of those that gave their life for the faith. We eventually get to the point where, if we look at his 81st homily, Maximus of Turin begins to talk about celebrating festivals for all of the martyrs, all of them. But he also says, even those that are departed brothers and sisters. So these festivals, these feast days, these hallowed days are for the martyrs and for those that departed brothers and sisters in the faith, not just those that died. So we know from the very beginning, Gary, this doesn't evolve in the sense of changing. Rather, this evolves in the sense of opening up the door to all martyrs, as well as those that died in the faith, not necessarily wow. as martyrs. Wow. Yeah. So the, yeah. So you can start seeing how the feast is slowly taking shape. And again, like you said, you know, this isn't a novelty that they just created on the spot. This is something that's a long running practice within Christianity. Yes. Yeah. And, and I always, I like to go towards um, the 500s, Gary. We look at, um, uh, the church father, uh, Romanos, the hymnographer. And wow, Gary, we get such an incredible um, text from him. He's writing about a universal feast of all the saints and martyrs of the world. And he's telling us everyone around the globe would gather for this festival. And he says, having gathered from every city and being our compatriots, they came out from all of the world and have taken us from the world and have made us participants in this feast. So hmm. we've got Romanos talking about something incredible there. He then goes on to say that this festival was not just for martyrs, but he says, let us celebrate a sacred feast for the things on earth have become heaven. The lights among the firmament, the martyrs among the multitudes have shone upon the church and enlightened the whole world. That David might therefore say with us that your lightning has shone upon the earth. Oh, oh, merciful, oh, most merciful one. So what Romanos is telling us here, he's talking about the martyrs in the church. He says that we celebrate. He talks about the blood of the martyrs. But he also says that they've become your saints, O oh Lord. So he's talking about an incredible festival, Gary, not just for the martyrs, but for all the saints in the whole world. And what does he say? People from all over the world celebrate this festival. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, again, you know, that points to the antiquity of the feast, because obviously it's not just one local region, but it's a, a universal feast, if you will. Yes, yes, no no doubt, Gary, no doubt. And we, we frequently hear about All Saints Day, 
then people wonder, well, you know what? You guys are talking about um, celebrating All Saints Day, but what on earth is Halloween? Yeah. Well, Gary, as you know, if we're going to have a Saints Day, we have to have Halloween because it is the evening before the celebration. <laughs> right. Really, all we're talking about is All Hallows Evening. It is the night before, it is the evening before we celebrate All Saints Day. And usually, as we know, the custom in the church was we began to honor the dead. We began to pray for those that are more alive in Christ than we currently are by beginning to pray the evening before the incredible feast day. Remember, Gary, this is not a day to be, um, you know, lurching around, you know, sad. This is a day of celebration because they have gone to eternal life with our Lord and Savior. They're in the presence of our triune God. It doesn't get any more incredible than that, Gary. Yeah, yeah. So so basically Halloween is just an old English way of saying All Hallows Eve, right? All, all Saints Eve. That is correct. It, it's an old, old-fashioned way of saying it. But then we, we get to the really interesting point. I love to save it for, la for towards the end, Gary. We, we have people say, well, you guys have been talking over and over about prayer for the dead. You've been talking about festivals for the dead. But where on earth did you guys just pull this date out of? You guys invented this. You guys must have just come up with it. There are no ancient roots for October 31st or November 1st. That is when I love to point towards Odalo of Cluny, who was a Benedictine. He was a monk from the 900s, Gary, from the 10th century. And Odalo was from the abbot of Cluny. He had a great desire. He, in his area, he noticed a lot of very, a lot of demonic activity, a lot of, you know, terrible things that were happening. He said, we've got to venerate those that are alive in Christ. We've got to venerate um, the dead, those that are more living in Christ. We need to consecrate this area, consecrate it for the Lord. And really, that is the very first time we hear about November 1st being All Saints Day. Hmm. Really? But he talked about it existing even beforehand. So we don't know exactly when that day first came up. We have the evidence in Odalo of Cluny, but the evidence is incredible because that shows you this practice predated him by a whole lot of time. Right. But therein comes the irony as well, Gary. Tell me what you think of this. Today we frequently hear, well, October 31st, demons, devils, and pagan rituals. But quite the opposite, Gary. The origin of this festival had Christianity, had Catholicism embedded within it. So this feast day, this festival was actually a hammer for this, for Satan, a hammer towards the demons, nothing evil in and of itself. Yeah, yeah that's a really good point. You know, the, uh, as Catholics, we have sanctified space. You know, all space is an equal. There are some spaces that are more holy than others. We also have sanctified time. There is times of the year that are more sanctified than others. Uh, you know, and uh, so... In a sense, this is kind of sacred time that's been marked out specifically for a very holy purpose, that is to honor those in heaven. No doubt, Gary, no doubt. And really, the significance cannot be downplayed, because when we read about what Odalo talked about, about this day, this particular Halloween celebrated by the church, this was not preserved in his own writing. It was preserved by St. Peter Damien. Peter Damien viewed it so important he said, we need to preserve what Odalo wrote. He viewed it so important that he preserved this particular part of Odalo's writings. And he tells us that this festival was present even in his day. So what does that tell us, Gary? One, there are ancient roots for festivals. Two, there are ancient roots for festivals that celebrate those that are in heaven with Christ, saints and martyrs. And three, there are ancient roots for this particular day being the day that we celebrate All Saints. Yeah, so how did uh, how All Hallows Eve end up being Halloween? You know, how did it get tied up with uh, uh, these ideas that are, you know, demonic or whatever? Yeah, Gary, you frequently hear, and as Catholics, we're the ones that get the, we get beat over the head with it most because you look at Protestantism, Gary, and they really, you know, they really don't celebrate Halloween. You know, they might go out trick-or-treating, 
But if you sit down with a Protestant and you ask them, why do you celebrate Halloween? They're going to tell you they don't do it. So really, we're the ones that catch all the flack for it. We're told, <laughs> you guys are celebrating a pagan festival, the festival of, uh, of Samhain. Uh, you guys, uh, Samhain, whatever way you, there's various ways of pronouncing that. We're told we're celebrating a pagan festival. But I always like to point to one thing, Gary. If we look at that pagan festival, if we look at when that began, there's no ancient pedigree there, Gary. And as we've talked about many times in this show, Gary, in fact, that is the heart of hands-on apologetics. That is why I love your show so much. What do you begin your show with? Talking about the early church fathers, right? Yeah. We must have pedigree. When we look at the ancient roots of the demonic within Halloween, the earliest we can find that to is the 1500s. Hmm. And that is saying that this, you know, comes from maybe the 900s. So the earliest evidence of this isn't early at all. Catholicism and the celebration of this festival predates the demonic by a whole lot, Gary. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that's an awesome point because uh, we've already staked out this territory of sacred, you know, Ours. and <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, in a way, it's kind of like, you know, the evil one always tries to, you know, cast mud and try to take advantage of, you know, uh, efforts of holy people. So uh, you kind of have this like reaction, you know, demonic reaction to something that's really deeply rooted in the church. Definitely, Gary. And I, I'd like to point people to one, to one thing also. I, I travel to Germany very often. When you go to Germany, sometimes you might look at those old cathedrals, Gothic ones. You might see gargoyles on them. You might see images of, of death, of skulls. People hmm. might wonder, well, why is Catholicism so macabre? Why is it so dark? Why is there celebration of evil? Well, there's not a celebration of evil. And this ties in perfectly with Halloween. There's nothing wrong with looking at those images, of looking at images of, of death. Why, Gary? Because we believe that Christ is the ultimate conqueror of death. When he resurrected, bodily resurrected from the dead, he showed us the truth of the resurrection and the beauty that we have to look forward to, Gary. And that is how we know that our faith has ancient pedigree. Yeah, absolutely. Well, William, <laughs> our hour has flown by yet again. And uh, how wow. can people get a hold of your stuff? They can go to www.patristicpillars.com, where, by the way, I will be offering a free mini book that I wrote on the Catholic origins of Halloween. And I will have it there on the very front page. Awesome. Very good. Patristicpillars.com, all one word. Thank you, William, for coming on the show. Gary, my dear friend, thank you for having me on. Have a happy Halloween. And you. And uh, also, coming up tomorrow, we're going to have Dr. Brian Bradford come on. He's going to give us uh, basically Islam 101, everything a Catholic needs to know about the history of Islam. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. He's done so much work in that area. And the fun continues, ladies and gentlemen, with the Terry and Jussie Show, High Impact Catholic Talk coming at you. It's time for me to shut down the Midwest Command Center here and turn off the dojo lights. It's been a pleasure being with you today, and uh, God willing, we will talk again soon. So everybody have a great day, and bye-bye. In the 1990s, I lived and worked in Hollywood. But when my wife Betty's mom took ill, we relocated to Orange County. And it was during this time in our lives that I converted to Catholicism. Once my eyes were open to the truth, I couldn't learn enough about the faith. But I had less free time than ever, especially with a long commute. That's when I discovered the real value of Catholic audio. Listening to cassette tapes transformed my daily commute into a miniature retreat. And that's the beauty of Virgin Most Powerful Radio today. Since the podcasts are archived, you can listen anytime on our smartphone app. I know how listening to Catholic audio can bring you closer to Christ and His Church, so I encourage you to visit the App Store or go to vmpr.org and download the app today. It just might change your life. I'm Matthew Arnold for Virgin Most Powerful Radio.